So let's take a step back a few years, rather decades, to the late 70s, early 80s. The Cold War had been going on for a while there, and that's a major topic, but the Cold War was the longest staring match in the universe between the US and the USSR, namely the America and Soviet Union. There were some other allies mixed in, and since we're talking about British Earl, obviously we're going to be focusing on the UK, but the long story short is that it was a time of suspicion and fear between all parties, generally centering around the idea of nuclear power and nuclear weapons as a whole. Now, ever since humanity managed to split the atom at the end of World War II and create the most devastating weapon known to mankind, and then get scared of it for another 50 years, and that's actually still ongoing. It's pretty alarming how many nukes there are. There have also been explorations into how to utilize this technology with peaceful intentions. Like, you don't have to make a bomb out of it. You could instead create a nuclear reactor and generate electricity. Now, nuclear plants get a bad rap because people are scared of them. Now, there have been the occasional accidents, but the point is when all safety regulations are followed and the authorities are careful, nuclear power is actually quite good, for the most part. I mean, it has zero emissions, for one, so its environmental footprint is practically nothing. And by practically, I mean the only major constant hiccup with nuclear power is the expended nuclear byproducts, namely waste. There's a bunch of different types of nuclear waste out there, but the stuff we're focusing on is high-level nuclear waste, Namely, the, the really, really, really dangerous stuff that you absolutely should never, under any circumstances, touch or really be near at all. There's just no real way to get rid of the stuff. Some of it can be reused, sometimes it varies, but a lot of it can't. And if you can't recycle it, you can't just throw it out because, uh, radioactive, you can't do anything with it, so what do you do? Well, most places, the plan is, uh, bury it. There are dedicated bunkers specifically for this one task of holding this stuff until it becomes no longer dangerous in a few thousand years, give or take, depending on the half-life of the elements involved, but either way, the point is that this stuff is going to be kicking around for a while. So yeah, when the reactor produces waste, the waste has to be transported to this place where it will stay inside, buried, for as long as it takes to be safe again. Thus solving the problem once and for all. But once and for all! But I bet you're wondering, what does all this have to do with a train? Well, in the UK, there was a bit of a controversy going on when it comes to the railroads being used to transport spent nuclear waste. In particular, nuclear flasks. Now, I'll be real, the name nuclear flask is in no way doing these things justice. When people hear the word flask, they usually think of, you know, like glass, like a little jar that you use in a laboratory or something. That is in no way what this thing is. These crates, which again is kind of underselling it, weigh 50 tons each and have solid metal walls over a foot thick. Even their lids are reinforced with 16 industrial bolts holding them in place. These things are designed specifically so that once something goes inside, it ain't coming back out again. These flasks aren't necessarily used to transport spent liquid waste that you may be thinking of when you think of toxic nuclear waste. No, in this case, they were used to transport the fuel rods. Fuel rods are a critical component of nuclear reactors, but every so often they need to be replaced. The old ones, which can't be used anymore, are naturally super de duper radioactive, and can't just be, again, thrown anywhere. They need to be stored, and they need to be transported, hence why the nuclear flask exists, to safely transport these fuel rods without, you know, exposing everyone to horrific radioactive side effects like growing third arms or something. But this is where the concern came up, because the trains were being used to transport these flasks. Now, radioactivity and radiation as a whole tends to be a bit of a buzzword in today's media, and it was no different back then. People hear radiation and suddenly they panic and think their face is going to melt off. When in reality, radiation as a whole is a pretty vague term, scientifically speaking. There's a lot of different kinds, and not all of it is necessarily dangerous. I mean, you get hit with radiation from the sun, which I'm pretty sure most of us are well adapted to dealing with. What people were really afraid of was the nuclear bomb reactor type radiation, gamma rays, and things like that. The stuff that can actually make your face melt off. And to be fair, if you got near these fuel rods and they were exposed, yeah, you would not be alright. 
D don't touch them. D d d don't. D don't even look at them. D don't even go near them. Just, just don't. They're bad. Yeah, that's why they were being transported to a place where they could go and sit and not bother anybody. Let us never speak of them again. But in the UK, trains are used a lot in terms of transportation, not just for freight, but with passengers too. That's similar in a lot of places, but the UK in particular really depended on its rail network. People were worried about sharing the lines with spent nuclear fuel, and were worried about the integrity of these flasks. It already came out that some radiation does escape from these flasks, even as well-built as they are. Now, to be fair, the concern was relatively moot, because the complaint was that, whoa, when a freight train passes by the station while I'm standing out, you know, waiting for my train, I'm getting irradiated. When in reality, the amount of radiation you receive, you know, fractions of a fraction from that train passing by is, uh, not anywhere near the amount you get from standing out of the sun on that same platform that same day, literally at that moment. So again, it was another buzzword situation where it's like, oh god, radiation, we're all gonna die. But it was the Cold War. So I understand why people were paranoid. Now the authorities had a few options here. One of them was simply reassurance. Because let's be real, they weren't gonna change their tactics when it came to taking care of these spent fuel rods. The flasks were going on the trains no matter what anyone said. And the reason for that is actually quite simple. It really is the best option when it comes to transporting these things, especially in the UK. Consider the alternatives. You can put them on a truck, sure, but a truck on the road is a lot more at risk of getting in an accident than a train is, or really most other things, to be honest. I mean, one dip who decides not to use his turn signal and suddenly you got a nuclear spill on the highway. I mean, it's just one of those things, so it doesn't really make much sense in that regard. You can put them on a plane, yeah, but to begin with, these things are very heavy, like I said, so it'd be expensive to put them on a plane that could handle the amount of weight that you'd need to deal with. And also, in a plane, I mean, it's not like planes can't have accidents, and then you have spent nuclear fuel falling out of the sky. And I don't think I need to explain why that would be alarming on many levels. But with a train, well, there's a few things to consider here. For one, trains are often used to transport toxic chemicals all over the place. It really is the most logical option. You could transport them in large quantities relatively safely. I mean, trains do get in accidents, but they're by no means common. And the rolling stock they use to transport the things tend to be very sturdy and heavy because locomotives can handle it. On top of that, a train is, well, on a track. So if you do want to transport something that's dangerous on a train, you always know exactly where it's going to go. The path can be predicted and planned out. So if it's something, you know, seriously dangerous, you at least have, you know, ways to set up safety precautions. That compared to the more chaotic trucking or the expensive plane option, trains fall squarely in the middle. They're effective, they're cheaper, and they really are the safer choices. But the general public didn't want to hear that because, you know, radiation, scary, ah! So what was one to do? Well, in 1983, they decided to stage and publicize a test of one of these flasks in a controlled environment, and watched it fall to the ground, and then checked to see if it leaked at all. They actually did this a few times at multiple different angles, one of which was on the flask's weakest point. They found that it held up extremely well, after falling from a height of 30 meters. But what people were really afraid of was a train accident. The British public had been around long enough to know what damage a train can do if it's involved in an accident. If a train hits something, whatever it's hitting is getting eviscerated, okay? There's no way around this. So as sturdy as the flask may seem, it's easy to imagine one simply blowing open if a train runs into it. So what's one to do in order to prove that this won't happen? Did you say, try it in a different controlled environment, like slam it against a concrete wall, maybe attach it to a rocket or a jet engine or something? Do it that way, like proper science? No. No, that's not the answer. The real answer is crash an actual, literal locomotive into one. Now, I do want to mention at this point that there was no nuclear material in any of the flasks involved with any of these experiments. Some articles I've read don't actually point this out. I mean, they don't say that they did, but they don't say that they don't either. So I had to dig deep to make sure, and no, there was no nuclear material in the flasks at all. The first one only had water. The second one, which we're about to get to, had steel rods that mimicked the weight and shape of the spent fuel rods that would normally be in the flask, in addition to water, which is always in the flask because it's how they keep it cool from the, you know, 
radioactive decay going on. I just wanted to stress that. Like, I know it's British Rail, but like, they're bad at buying diesels. They're not super villains, all right? Like, let's be real about this. Now, I know I blame British Rail for this, and yes, they were a part of it, but actually the whole experiment was set up by the Central Electricity Generating Board, or CEGB. They were effectively the government entity that handled the power grid in the UK at that time. So, they were the ones responsible for the whole nuclear power thing going on. Therefore, they had to negotiate with British Rail in order to make this happen. British Rail seemed willing to accommodate and volunteered one of their own engines for this esteemed task of being horribly destroyed. The engine in question was a Class 46. Class 46 is actually notable because it's one of the few designs to come out of the modernization plan that didn't completely fail miserably. They were actually all right. So naturally, you know, with the good diesels, you're gonna choose to slam one of them into the nuclear flask. Not one of the bad ones. You're gonna, you're gonna choose one of the ones that actually somewhat functioned. Because it's British Rail, and that's how they roll, I guess. Now, I joke, but this diesel was already on its way to the scrapyard. The second test happened in 1984, and the Class 46s were already 20 years old. Now, that's not exactly ancient by locomotive standards, but they were still being phased out, and the engine 46009, or formerly D146, was already going to be scrapped anyway. But I just can't get over that this is their plan. Like, this is how you're going to settle public opinion. This is how you're going to ease everyone's nerves, by actually slamming a real, live, actual train into a nuclear flask. Like, I know there's no real danger here in terms of radiation, but still, it's the weirdest thing to me. I mean, I know that we in America had our own share of staged train accidents. We've already talked about the crash at Crush, and there were a few more like that, so I'm not saying that, like, my country is in any way innocent, but this was in the 80s, you'd think it would be more reasonable by now. And they said they were doing it in the name of science, but I would argue that there's way better ways to do this to get the data you need. This thing kind of screens of a publicity stunt to ease everyone's nerves. Just, you know, here, look, watch, we're gonna crash a train, and look, it's fine, you'll be okay. But to be honest, my opinion doesn't really matter here, because either way, they did what they were gonna do. They absolutely slammed this engine, with three passenger cars attached to it, because why not, at that point, into a nuclear flask that was sitting on a flat car on the closed-off line of track. The diesel was going at about 100 miles per hour at the time. And it hit hard. It actually erupted in a fireball, and the flask itself was actually sent flying off in the opposite direction. The Class 46 was naturally completely decimated, and it was scrapped on sight. The flask, on the other hand, survived mostly intact, with only a small, itsy bitsy, teensy weensy little bit of a leak, which was called a success, but. Now, now hold the phone. First of all, I don't want to hear any leak at all when it comes to these flasks, okay? I'll be real with you. Like, I understand the basic concepts of radiation and the basic ins and outs of it, but when it comes to transporting spent nuclear fuel, I don't want to hear a leak in anyone's sentence. Now, again, it was minuscule, but my problem here is this was a controlled test. In a train crash, I mean, anything can go wrong. And trains have only gotten faster since then. The train that they used, while it was going incredibly fast, was arguably not nearly as heavy as a lot of trains tend to be on the UK's line. I mean, obviously the passenger cars were empty, and so was the diesel, so that's a lot of weight that just didn't hit this flask. Another factor that you want to consider is that the train sent the flask, which weighs multiple tons, sailing in the opposite direction, like I said, it flying. What if the flask, whether it opens or not, lands on, like, a passenger car or something? Or anything. I mean, nothing underneath this flask is going to live, and just what I'm trying to say. So this stunt really doesn't spell out safety to anybody. It's just like, yeah, see, we can hit it and it's fine. Which, great, also it's still gonna be a little bit dangerous. I mean, it, you weren't gonna stop using the railroad to transport these things anyway. So do you really care about changing people's minds, or did you just want an excuse to crash a train? Were you bored? I mean, I think there was more going on in the 80s. I don't know, maybe the UK was boring at the time. I'm just spitballing here. It just seems like a waste of a diesel you could have donated to somebody if you really didn't care about scrapping it. I mean, you did scrap it on sight, but an intact diesel is always worth more than a completely obliterated one, even as scrap. Just so we're clear, they still totally use the railway to transport nuclear waste in the UK. 
But like I said, that's not unusual. A lot of freight trains get used to transport hazardous waste. It just happens to be the most sensible way to go. No one complains about it because the word radiation doesn't come up in most things that aren't nuclear waste. The second you say that, and people are afraid, but you know, there's plenty of horrible things that are transported on railways that nobody really talks about. So on one hand, I think this whole test was a little flawed, if not pointless, but on the other, the whole situation was a little silly because people were only going after the radioactive buzzwords when in reality, the trains will always be used to transport horrible things that if the train crashes, uh, will do some great harm. So I think just the best option here is to make sure the trains don't crash. How about that? That sound good? I agree with that idea. In case anyone's wondering, there are actually three Class 46s that still survive into preservation. 46010, 46035, and 46045 are all still around. So at least that's something. Also, seriously, don't touch spent nuclear fuel. It's really bad for you. Until next time, this is Darkness, and the Vigilella Fawn, farewell.